Hello, my name is Rick Houston, and welcome to the Scene Vault Podcast, your source for all things NASCAR history. Presented by Las Vegas Motor Speedway, America's racing showplace. I had a friend that was dirt racing, Don Jenkins, needed some help one weekend, and I said, ah, I don't really care about going doing that. He's like, come on, I need some help. So <laughs> I went with him, and uh, man, I've been stuck on it ever since. you got to read how it's written. And uh, when you do that, you can uh, get those workarounds for most everything. We can get it done on Saturday, but we're not getting it done on yeah. Sunday. So it was like we shouldn't be making this transition because we weren't ready for it. In a lot of ways, I did Dave a lot of good. And maybe I did him a disservice, too, because a lot of times I gave him what he wanted. The day NASCAR and all of us associated in any way with NASCAR forget its past, that's the day we don't have any future. Hello, everyone. I'm Steve Wade. And my name is Rick Houston, and welcome to the Scene Vault Podcast, presented by Las Vegas Motor Speedway, America's racing showplace, and a track that truly does care about NASCAR history. So, Steve, this week, buddy, old pal, old friend of mine and former boss of mine, <laughs> the boys and I went to the Xfinity and cup races at Martinsville and we went old school. Oh yeah. I know what that means. We didn't have garage passes. Uh huh. We weren't in any suite or press box. Uh huh. We didn't have a media parking spot. We parked in the regular parking lots, sat in the grandstands. Adam and Jesse got to see their first pit road fight. <laughs> <laughs> that was a bonus. Adam was going to go get the car and try to move it up a little bit while me and Jesse made our way out to the car. He was going to take off as soon as the checkered flag fell. And I said, you might want to wait for a second. <laughs> 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 Sit still. And sure enough, Ty Gibbs and Sam Mayer, they did not disappoint me in the least. They did not disappoint the boys. And all the way back home, Adam and Jesse were on their phones watching replays. I bet. I told you it was a bonus. The hook is getting a little deeper. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Well, then came Saturday. We were this close to freezing our behinds off <laughs> <laughs> in the snow and the wind. And yeah, okay. It might be possible that I left a little bit early to get back to the car. And more importantly, the seat warmers. <laughs> in my car steve honestly and truly i don't know that i have ever been that cold in my life ever i can tell you one thing it can get cold at some racetracks particularly through the spring of the year i mean richmond and rockingham and atlanta in the past we've had some mighty cold days at those tracks so i know exactly how you feel and today I'm sitting here in my shorts and a short sleeve t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> Don't like the weather. Just wait around five minutes and it'll change. Anyway, yeah, you, you thought I bet. <laughs> <laughs> and Steve, this was all thanks to Bill Stripling, a listener of ours and a true friend of the show. He is a Patreon supporter. He helped out with the new 4k camera. And Steve, I will never be able to repay Bill for showing us so many kindnesses. So well, thank you very much, Bill. Thank you. Really. But Steve, then best of all, I think that I was able to score some pretty major cool points with Adam and Jesse. Bill was supposed to meet with Tad Geschichter near the crossover to the infield there in turn four. And Tad drives up in this huge limo looking thing of a golf cart. And we talked for a minute and Tad asks if we all want to hop on the cart and go to his motor coach and eat and warm up a little bit. So here we all pile on, we go to the coach and we're talking a little bit. Well, then in walks Ricky Stenhouse Jr. No. So Adam and Jesse were just truly impressed that they got to go behind the scenes like that. Now that is the only VIP kind of thing that we got to do the whole weekend. You talk about them boys taking the bait even deeper <laughs> now. <laughs> Well, Tad offered Adam and Jesse something to eat. And I looked at Tad and I said, you might want to rethink that. <laughs> <laughs> there goes your racing budget. But Steve, here's another thing. 
that was truly gratifying and truly humbling about the entire weekend. I had several listeners come up to me completely at random and thank me for doing this show and to say that they download it and check it out every single week. That had to be very, very satisfying for you, Rick. That's a great feeling to have. After all that, I did tweet and say that if anybody wanted to meet, that I would be under the grandstands at about 6.30 on Saturday evening. But, Steve, it was so crowded, which is a good thing in the grand scheme of things. It was so crowded because there were so many people there, and there was no self-service. And I missed out on the chance to get to meet our friends, Edwin Turner and Craig Dedman and Clark Ruland for the first time. I know that they were planning on coming. I know that they were planning to be there and (laughs) Edwin and Craig, they were evidently maybe 10, 20 yards from where we were and where we were waiting. I did get to see Robin Scarberry and his daughter, but Edwin and Craig were probably maybe 10, 20 yards from where Robin and his daughter and I were standing and again, it was just so packed and there was yeah. no cell service and we just couldn't make that connection. So Edwin and Craig and Clark, I apologize. And if anybody else was there and trying to meet up, I apologize. I need to take some Twitter tweet up lessons from. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, Steve, it just amazes me, but we are doing something right with this podcast. In spite of ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I had that bump for sure. In spite of ourselves. All those compliments and all the support that we have received over the years from people like Bill Stripling, and then to be able to experience this weekend at Martinsville like we did. Here is my takeaway from the entire weekend. To be a race fan, you have to be hardcore. That's just the bottom line. To be at the racetrack so early. And to wait in all those lines and then to be in the stands to watch a race and then to stand up for all the restarts and then to sit back down, then to stand back up, then to sit back down, then to stand back up, then to sit back down. (laughs) (laughs) You freeze in the winter, you burn up in the summer, but to do that, you've got to love this sport. And if fans can love the sport enough to experience all that, the very least that you and I can do is try to produce the very best podcasts that we possibly can, get the very best interviews we possibly can, and to keep doing what we're doing. So do we have a deal? Are you in? Absolutely. And Rick, I was taught a long time ago that race fans are truly hardcore. They love their sport. They put up with a lot to attend their sport. Therefore, you as a journalist have to do the best you can for them. Tell them straight up what's going on. Let them know because they know what's going on. Don't try to fool them. That's the way I look at it. So like you just said, we got to do our best for the fans because they're hardcore fans and they like what we're doing and we can't let up one bit. Well, I think that's a lesson that a lot of media could learn is to maybe spend some time out in the grandstands and to see what makes the fans tick and to see what they want. Yes, and I have done that more than once. And you got your picture on the cover of Grand National Scene for doing that one time. That's right. (laughs) Bristol. I just want to know one thing. How many did that particular issue sell? I mean, was that a hot seller with you on the cover? You know, I don't think so. (laughs) (laughs) All the story was well received. I'm not too sure about that cover. (laughs) (laughs) Steve, this week in our first segment, we are going to share the first of what will be three installments with longtime NASCAR crew chief, Gil Martin, who takes us through the, his very first days in the sport. A buddy of his needed help out at the old Nashville Fairgrounds Raceway, and Gil didn't particularly want to go, but he went anyway, and that was a move that very obviously turned out to change the course of his life. Gil also remembers. Bobby Hamilton and the genesis of Philmar Racing and the growing pains that that Nashville based operation faced with four very different drivers, Bobby and then David Green and Jeff Burton and finally Kenny Wallace. And then Gil takes us through his move to Richard Childress Racing. 
Then in our second segment, we're going to go back to the April 16th, 1992 issue of Winston Cup scene. Davy Allison wins at North Wilkesboro, despite being battered, bruised, and sore from an accident the race before in Bristol. Bobby Hillen gets put in lockdown due to a run-in with Kyle Petty, and there's actually a connection to that incident and our new NASCAR Technical Institute studio. I have no idea what that is. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, well, you've been thinking about that. See if you can put in a guess. <laughs> But wait, there's more. Dave Marcus helps pave the way for NASCAR to make its first appearance at Indianapolis Motor Speedway. A young Dale Jarrett tumbles out of his car while his daddy, Ned, is trying to leave North Wilkesboro Speedway. (laughs) A junior Johnson and Associates crew member is unable to go on an important mission because he's locked in a port (laughs) john Finally, Steve, there is an almost unbelievable connection in the pit pass section. Again, to our deal with John Dotson at the NASCAR Technical Institute. Now, I know what that one is. And I know what that one is. And John actually tweeted about it. But Steve, this one completely blows me away. Listeners, if you possibly can, please support us on Patreon. Support us on PayPal support us on Venmo. I got to be honest with you. It's been a couple of weeks since we've gotten a new Patreon support. And I know things happen, but that support makes this podcast possible. So it always makes me a little nervous when we don't get new Patreon support, but it is what it is. And we do need that support. If you possibly can, please support us on Patreon, support us on PayPal or Venmo, support us by dropping us a five-star rating and or a positive glowing awesome review (laughs) on iTunes or Spreaker or Spotify or whatever podcast platform you catch us on. The address for Patreon is patreon.com. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash the same vault podcast. Or if you would prefer to do a one-time show of support, you can do that via paypal.me slash the same vault podcast or Venmo at the same vault podcast. And also just as a reminder, this show is not affiliated in any way with American city business journals, owners of the same brand. Well, Gil, if I'm not mistaken, you first started out working and racing at the fairgrounds there in Nashville, didn't you? I did. Uh, right around probably 1982. Okay. Now, what were you doing? Well, actually, I had a motorcycle shop part-time Okay. after getting out of school. And I had a friend that was dirt racing, Don Jenkins, who was with a local company there, Athens Paper, was dirt racing. Needed some help one weekend. And I said, ah, I don't really care about going doing that. He's like, come really? on, I need some help. So <laughs> I went with him, and, uh, man, I've been stuck on it ever since. <laughs> How did you get hooked up with Fillmore? Through the fairgrounds because okay. of the fact after uh, Don quit racing, we uh, another guy from Nashville, Andy Dunlap, and I started building late models, and David Shacklett drove the car. Well, uh, he drove it for one year, and he had a wreck, broke his neck. We had to put somebody in the car, and Bobby Hamilton was running for the championship that year in 87 and he needed a ride so it kind of worked out so he came to us because our cars were always fast and so he came to us and we jumped in won the championship there for about three years in a row and then uh filbert that was with uh filmar racing he was sponsoring a ford team there at that time well i guess he was tired of us beating him so he actually bought our late model team from us and we started filmar racing in the late uh late 1989 I went back on your Facebook page and was looking at some of your photos, and you and Bobby go back a long way. We do. Tell me about Bobby Hamilton. I mean, Bobby, was a, he was a different kind of guy. I mean, if there was ever a blue-collar racer, <laughs> yeah. it was Bobby. I mean, he drove a wrecker all day long, 
And then at night, you know, we'd work on the cars. And we eventually moved all the cars to my house. I built a shop there and everything. So he would come over in the daytime. We had guys working on it, but he would always bring us something to eat. Had his dog he brought with him, Elwood, who was a German <laughs> shepherd. That was a, he was a real piece of work. But, uh, I mean, but Bobby was just, uh, he was just a good all-around guy. And we just, everybody got along well. Now, you started off late model racing with Bobby. And then Philbert came in, he bought the team. At what point did you start thinking about going bush racing? Was well, that just the natural progression? Or? I think it was just a natural natural progression because Daryl had come to the racetrack. Obviously, uh, he'd come in on different weekends, and he actually drove one of our late models one weekend. And uh, we ran really well with him that weekend. I think we sat on the pole. We should have won the race. There was some controversy about Bill Elliott driving the Ford car that night. And Daryl kind of let him, uh, what to say, Bill passed him in the late stages on Two Rivers Ford night. Yeah. We'll leave it at that. <laughs> Controversy at yeah, Nashville? You exactly. <laughs> you can't, you can't, it's hard to believe, isn't it? But, uh, no, there was a, there was, it was a natural progression because when he would come to town, Bobby would drive his car for him. When Daryl was going to come in for a Bush event, Bobby would set the cars up for him and everything. So they became great friends. And then as that went on, it was just time for us to go Bush racing. So we went, bought an old Nova from uh from daryl came over to charlotte and picked it up as one of the old body styles from eddie jones and yeah uh we just uh we went from there now you mentioned the fact that you had a motorcycle shop is that what you were doing full time or what or were you racing full time no uh I, I had a motorcycle shop in the evening because okay. we just decided a friend of mine that i went to school with decided that you couldn't buy motorcycle parts or to get them worked on after you got off work so we opened it four o'clock in the afternoon till nine at night I actually worked on at a, a video store, worked on video games and pinball machines. Uh, really? When I got out of school, that's what I was doing in the daytime. We'd work on motorcycles at night, and it just uh, we did that for three or four years and loved it a lot, but racing kind of, uh, kind of took over. Were you looking to get into racing, or did you just kind of follow along as the team, the late model team with Bobby kind of progressed up the ladder? You know, I really wasn't looking to get into racing, but it just uh, it just kept morphing uh -huh. into something different all the time. And somehow, I don't know, I, I ended up being the, the lead dog all the time at, at uh, orchestrating how things were getting done or during the week where we were going to get things and how we were going to get things done. Because being in Nashville, trying to get parts, pieces, and technology from the Carolinas was always tough. So I was always tasked with tracking some of that stuff down. Luckily, I had a tremendous mentor in Nashville, Mike Alexander, yeah. that, I mean, I've, I'll never be able to repay him everything he taught me about racing that people that today don't even have to go through. But uh, he taught me so many things about racing, and it also taught me about just the what it took to not just run, not just to race, but to race up front. So Philmar started out with Bobby its first three seasons, 88, 89, 90. Then came David Green in 91, Jeff Burton in 92 and 93, and then Kenny Wallace beginning in 94. How difficult was it to transition from one driver to another during all those seasons? Uh, it wasn't too bad because the seat situation is nowhere as complex as it is now. So we were able to, to tr you know, go through that transition pretty easily. The biggest thing was was just trying to transition, obviously, into uh, sponsorship, into uh, logistics. Again, being from Nashville and racing every single week, whether it was in Orange County or Oxford, Maine, that uh, tech took up two days of our week automatically just in travel. So logistically, it was tough. But we had a, I mean, we had a very strong team. But when we left, our shop left. Yeah. There was nobody left at home. <laughs> so we came back and yeah. we did well, everybody did back then. But you got out on the road and back then it, it didn't matter where you were racing. If you had an issue, all the teams pitched in to help with either parts, pieces, or even labor. I mean, I remember the Houstons helped us tremendously through some of those transitions at the track. Bob Labonte as gruff and as, <laughs> as mad as he would get and everything else. If you ever need something, you could go to him, you could get stuff. Yeah. And uh, and it was more like a traveling family between all the teams back then, so that made it easier. Personality-wise, how would you compare those four drivers? Because to me, 
it would almost seem like if you had sat down and said, okay, we got four drivers and we're going to get four completely different personalities. Exactly. You couldn't have done a better job of getting different personalities. Well, the way that the flow went on that actually worked out pretty good because David Green was just meek, mild. Yeah. And, I mean, you go out to dinner with him, he'd order a salad without lettuce. I mean, that was one of the big things with him. But he was just very, very quiet. So then we went into Jeff Burton, and uh, he was a more he, he was more structured a little bit probably. Yeah. But his personality was – he wasn't as – as calm as David, yeah. but he was nowhere near as wide open as Kenny. So the progression worked out pretty good right yeah. there. It was yeah. kind of like putting your toe in a swimming pool Baby step. and jumping on in. Because when we got to Kenny, obviously uh, the whole personality aspect picked yeah. up. All right, so I have to ask. I broke into the sport in 91, 92, and I was at New River Valley in 92 when you guys got hit with the illegal rear end or whatever. Right. What happened? Well, if you if you read the rule book back then, the rule book stated that you had to have a Detroit locker type rear end. Okay. All it right. didn't say mandatory, it said type. Yeah. So it had to meet a few qualifications. So with that being said, back then a true track or a gold track was just getting into into the sport a lot and so we instituted one. We ran it. We actually had run it a couple other weeks, and it wasn't like it was night and day made the car that much yeah, better. Yeah. It just uh, – that was just a good track for us all around, and we ran really well that night. So we had to go through a bunch of stuff about getting the car taken care of, had to take the rear end out of it, send it to Larry Pollard. We didn't know nothing until the next day. But the one thing that did happen, Robert Black rewrote the rule book that it said <laughs> Detroit locker rear end only. It didn't say type. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, that's where a lot of people talk about cheating and reading between the rules. You've got to read how it's written. And uh, when you do that, you can, uh, you, there's workarounds for most everything. How did you wind up as the crew chief? At what point did you take over as crew chief? <laughs> really from the get-go, I guess, because okay. the late model team – was was my late model team okay. that we raced at Nashville. So uh, somebody had to take that position, I guess, back then. It wasn't like the crew chief is now or I became later on in racing. That was just more I had to go to the meetings at the racetrack and somebody had to be there to answer the questions. But we had five or six guys that were all fairly capable of doing that and that bonded well together, and it just was a – I guess it just became a natural progression for me because I was able to uh, had had the gift of gab. I guess yeah. what could talk to the NASCAR officials when I needed to and smooth them over when I needed to and argue when I needed to. <laughs> you eventually became a very successful crew chief, won a lot of races, but in those early days, what was your learning curve? like to get to that point where you were ready to go cup racing full-time and win races on a regular basis Uh, it was a it was a tremendous learning curve because the first cup race we ran was at loudon loudon new hampshire with uh jeff burton actually and that car we got we were already on an engine deal in the bush series with roush so philbert with his relationship with them since we were getting our purchase our engines from them uh, we were able to get a car that was basically race ready and Chris Hussey, who posts a bunch of pictures all the time, yeah. I posted a picture of that car not that long ago, and he remembered. It was JR22 was the car number, and they gave it to us race ready. We got that car in the shop, and it was like getting a uh, the best gift you could ever get. Somebody handed us a top-notch Winston Cup car. It was in our shop. Nobody was around. We weren't sneaking peeks of it, so we jacked it up, looked at every inch of it, took it apart, scaled it, and tried to – get as much knowledge as we possibly could from one of the top tier teams uh went to loudon finished uh, qualified fourth ended up getting wrecked on like the second lap our own fault though we spotter cleared him low and we wrecked early in the race so that part was disappointing but as far as the transition into cup racing to where we got we uh as we went cup racing with square d at Fillmore. We had a lot of good runs, but we also had a tremendous amount of disappointments yeah. of back then when you had second round qualifying, you'd sit on the back of the truck with Elmo Langley and say, <laughs> should we re-go? To, should we qualify again today? Should we stand on our time? What's the weather going to be like? What's our tires going to yeah. be like? Yeah. He was a tremendous asset to everybody that was on the bubble of getting in a race. But we had to go home several times, and there is nothing more deflating or anything else than to go to the racetrack 
do all that preparation and have to go home. But looking back, that was some of the best things that ever happened to us because we could go back and everybody goes back and debriefs now. Back then, we'd go home, be aggravated, just evaluate what happened. What do we need to do to get better? What do we miss it on? And I think that we got better with that. We actually had some good runs with Phil Moore, some opportunities to win. Uh, we sat on our first pole at Martinsville. And I remember Ray Everham came over to me in the driver's meeting and said, man, you guys were flying in practice. You stepped our game up. And I think Jeff ended up winning that race. We ran third or fourth or something. But what it, the effort that it took to get there, looking back, uh, you didn't at the moment you didn't think that it was that much different of an effort, but it really was. Yeah. Because there's so many things that you had to do wrong to figure out what to do right. Wow. That's yeah. and that that's that's the biggest thing that I think I saw on the learning curve is you do a hundred things during the course of the week and every one of them fail. But one of them works, and yeah. that sticks with you. But the biggest thing that you have to be able to do is Monday morning, you have to be able to flush it. you got to be able to forget it. Yeah. All that stuff that you were positive that was going to work through the week, on Monday morning, if it didn't work, you had to forget about it and leave your feelings at the door. If it was your idea and the greatest idea in the world and it was a terrible idea, it just was that. You had to go and be able to go again. And that's what I think uh, was the biggest transition for me. And I really think that was one of the biggest things that, uh, that Harvick helped me with was the fact of he was such a perfectionist and he was so confident in his ability that when the people around him didn't get up to where he thought they needed to be or they weren't taken as seriously as him, he was extremely hard on people. I mean, now Rodney and those guys at Stuart Haas, uh, they're, not, they're not getting the real Harvick. They're getting the much more calm and the mellower kinder, harvest. The kinder, gentler oh, I'm just telling you. But, but I take that. I mean, that's, that's a positive for him yeah. and for us yeah. because a lot of people, that's why I think we had to switch so many teams at, uh, at RCR just because of the fact of a lot of people couldn't handle that pressure. And I, I think I was on and off Harvick's crew chief three times. But it was good for us in each time because he learned something different from somebody else he was working with. And so did I, whether it was Robbie or Skinner or Clint or whatever. And when we'd get back together each time, all the stuff that we had learned or forgot about or missed, quite frankly, would become a positive. And so the progression in that got much better each time until we – I mean – the only time that I really hated the new playoff system, I guess it was 2010 or whatever. If it had been the old system, we'd have won the championship by like 300 points. Yeah. Because when we re-racked the points at Martinsville or wherever it was, we had almost a 400-point lead. And that's probably one of the most devastating weekends of my life, going in with that kind of lead and coming out equal. Yeah. I did. That, that wasn't a that wasn't a very happy moment for me, but. <laughs> But I look back at it and yeah. know that uh, that's just how the rules were then. So you had to play by what they were. Was there a specific moment when you felt like, as a crew chief, all right, I've got this. I think I know what I'm doing. Was there a specific moment where you felt like that? Uh, I think probably. Or did you ever feel like <laughs> No. Well, I, I never really felt like I got it. Yeah. To 100% because it was it was evolving all the time, yeah. whether we were going into the car tomorrow in 2007 yeah. Yeah. or whatever the stuff that was going on. But I felt more comfortable with my peers yeah. because going into the garage, and it's intimidating for anybody. When you go into the garage and you see Richard Petty or Dale Earnhardt or you see all these guys that you're there with, you see those drivers, they're intimidating. But from my point of view, you go into the garage and you see Dale Inman and you see – uh, Jake Elder, whoever that you saw back in the older days, knowing the things that they had done to pioneer the sport, I, I had to stand back a lot of times because yeah. I would really, I would look at them as guys that I really looked up to and did and almost didn't think I needed to be there with them. And that was one of the mo things I'm really, really proud of that worked good for us at Fillmar is that we, uh, we actually got to hire Jake Elder for his last job. Oh, wow. And okay. he came into the shop. He did some suspension and different things, but what he did was he taught a lot of our guys in the shop the I don't, I don't want to call them the old ways, but yeah, I'm going to call yeah. them the right ways yeah. because none of it was analytical because with Jake wasn't very good at reading or writing yeah. or anything else. The guys played tricks on him all the time, moving his tools around yeah. the toolbox because he would looking for what they were, <laughs> but he would stay on those guys, get on them when they needed it, 
He would never just flat pat you on the back and tell you good job, but in his own way, he would let you know what you were doing. And that's what I, I really, really enjoyed that aspect of it. But when, when I felt like I could walk into the garage and talk to these guys on the same level with them, I felt comfortable. But I never did really feel like I know what I'm doing today. <laughs> Going back to 1994, we talked about Kenny Wallace coming on board, and you did win three races that year. Everything looked good. The following year, 1995, you run Winston Cup and the Bush Series, and it was pretty tough, and you talked about this. It was pretty tough on the Cup side with a bunch of DNQs. How difficult was that for you to handle? It it was extremely difficult because – uh, when we had the Red Dog sponsorship coming in, we would take we would take the Bush car. We'd just come out of a season where we ran – I don't know how many laps we led that year, yeah. but we had a lot of DNFs from engine failures. And so we were having a lot of success. We were running the Red Dog car on Saturday, won races with it. Then Sunday, have to load the truck car up in the truck and go home and not to get to be in the race. And it was, it, it was devastating because – you were like, we can get it done on Saturday, but we're not getting it done on yeah. Sunday. So it was like, uh, you know, what are we doing wrong here? We don't, we don't, we shouldn't be making this transition yeah. because we weren't ready for it. But at the same token, uh, even though we had to close that company and we did everything else, all those guys that were on that team, if right now there's a several of them still scattered through the Cup Garage, and they went on to be extremely successful. That were very talented guy. We had a lot of talented guys there that populated the garage, and we all kind of went to college at the same time. Yeah. And it's extremely in, uh, unfortunate the fact that we couldn't have done that learning process somewhere else and put that group of guys together later. Yeah. Because the talent we had was uh, it was as good as anybody's. Was there a sense that maybe you had bitten off more than you could chew going cup racing? Oh shoot! Every day. Okay. I mean, just right. because the fact that we were, uh, we still d- tried to do it a little bit from Nashville, and then we, so we had to go through the fact of we moved from Nashville to Concord, uh, North Carolina, and then tried to go through that move, set up a shop, get a, you know, just get involved with the people over here, the vendors, yeah, yeah. the everybody trying to find a house, everybody going through just a different life change, trying to do that, and we had a couple of guys that actually moved back home. Yeah. Because it was a big undertaking for everybody. Yeah. Because when you're, we were having a ton of success from Nashville, whether it was at the fairgrounds or bush racing, we were always a threat to run up front or win some races or do whatever else. And then you get over there and you go a seven day a week, 16 hours a day, never seeing your family and your wives are having to take care of everything. And, yeah. and, and you don't know place. nothing that's going on. It was tough. Yeah. And, that that was a, it was a wake up call for a lot of people. Like, do I really want to do this? Yeah. And you had to make that decision. I mean, it, it was a life changing decision. Now, didn't you text me that you became a co owner? I did in Philmar. Well, that because I was on the fence. I mean, I was born and raised in Nashville. I had a lot of success at the fairgrounds. Was doing some other racing with uh, whether it was Mike Alexander or a guy named Gray Bickley that was there. We were running All American Challenge and still. Uh, won a championship with another guy in late models, uh, Nikki Famosa at Nashville. So we were having a lot of success. Uh, my parents were there. My mother had just passed away mm. not that far, not, not too many years before that. My dad was there, so I was like, I don't really want to move. I don't want to go. And so I, was, I had to stay on the fence. So in order to convince me to go, Philbert gave me part ownership in the company wow. to go. Wow. And so – I went, still reluctantly I went. I'm glad I did. <laughs> yeah. It was just, but uh, I needed a nudge, and that was the nudge I needed. How did you wind up leaving the team? Well, we just, we, we started struggling, and things just weren't going where it needed to go. And it, I was I was looking at other teams and thinking, man, there's, there's other opportunities out here. I'm just not growing like I need to here. So that's what I ended up doing. I mean, I left. I went to Bill Davis which was a extremely good opportunity for me because it just it, how it worked out he uh, he was going to start a bush team again and because Amico had come to him about a sponsorship they had Dave Blaney coming in and uh, he called me up about coming to talk to him and and building a building a bush team and we did that and I guess we raced it for a year or two and then we went cup racing with that 
And uh, again, that was a big learning curve because that was before the trend of all these dirt guys coming in and everybody knowing how to harness them. And probably uh, in a lot of ways, I did Dave a lot of good. Maybe I did him a disservice too because a lot of times I gave him what he wanted. And yeah. he wanted to be loose and fast like he was in his dirt cars. And well, we qualified on a lot of poles, Brent let a lot of laps ran up front, but we also crashed a lot <laughs> because we stayed on the edge yeah, yeah, a lot. Yeah, yeah. And probably I should have been better at dialing the car back. That was a big part of my learning curve, too, of a difference between practice qualifying and racing. A lot of people could be yeah. fast. Yeah. Jeff Gordon kind of went through it in the beginning when he crashed so many times and they had to dial him back to get to the point from being fast and being just uh, competitive. After being with Phil Marr literally from day one, before day one, right? how hard was it for you to not be there anymore? Oh, it was extremely hard. Uh, just because the fact of it was like sending a, a kid off to college. Yeah, I yeah. mean, it was a, it was an organization. I still knew all the guys and still was extremely happy with them. They actually sat on a pole at Bristol after I left on a car, short track car, a new one that we had built. We were very proud of that thing and went to Bristol, sat on the pole, and that was a, that was a big deal. Even though I wasn't there, it was a big deal for me because I yeah. knew w- what that meant. But still, we were at, with that company, we were in a position to where Square D was a major sponsor, but it wasn't major dollars. Yeah. So we just – we weren't going to be able to push that envelope because the fact it was just too expensive. Most of our uh, sponsorship money went to engines. I mean, whether we were Roush and we went to Robert Yates for a little while, most of that money that you would get at that point went to the engine program. So it left very little money for just building the team, building product in the team, hiring people, paying them what they needed to be paid. And as our people got better, people were stealing them just because of the fact that they could pay them more. Yeah. And back then, everybody heard it. He'd roll your toolbox down the street for $25 yeah. because the sport was so competitive back then that everybody was looking for guys that were already trained, that knew the disciplines, that knew the routine. And so we were getting robbed in that way. Yeah. So that, that was basically the downfall because we just didn't have the capital just to keep going. It was just too hard. Now, you're talking about that was Philmar? Or yeah, it was Philmar, okay. yeah. There isn't anything for you on racing reference in '98. Were you still working in NASCAR, or were you doing something outside? No, of the I was. Sport? I was still in NASCAR, but uh, 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 Richard Jackson, I helped them uh-huh. some. I went back and was doing some late model racing, okay, and just doing some different things like that, just trying to figure out what I was going to do. And that's about the time Bill Davis called me, okay, All and right. that's when that got going. So uh, it was just kind of a, what am I going? Where am I going to go from here? What am yeah. I going to do? Yeah. You worked with uh, Bill Davis and Dave Blaney in 99 and 2000. You talked about that. Then you wound up at RCR, Richard Childress Racing, mm-hmm. in 2001. How did that transition take place? That's a pretty funny story, actually, because, because of the fact of uh, when we went cup racing with Dave at Bills, uh, we weren't having the success we needed. We cra- had several crashes and everything else. Had a big sponsor with Amico and BP. And they were wanting to do something different, so it was just time that Dave needed to change too. And maybe I wasn't giving him what he needed at the point. And so Bill wanted to try something different, so we just we parted ways. We went on, and so I was we had a we had a motorhome at that time that uh, Chuck Spicer had fixed me up. <laughs> Chuck <with>. Spicer. <laughs> and so we had that, and so we were like, I don't know what we're gonna do. I'm not gonna talk to nobody for a little while. I'm just gonna clear my head. I don't want to even talk about racing. So Rhonda and Ford and I jumped in that thing. We headed to Myrtle Beach. Did you? And we're at Myrtle Beach down there, and we're trying to decide what we're going to do. And I think we'd pulled up to a grocery store or something. And uh, Rhonda had gone in to get us something. I was sitting out in the in the motorhome. It was just a little Winnebago. It wasn't nothing special. Yeah. Yeah. And we were sitting there, and I was in the back doing something. Ford was sitting up front because he always thought he had to fit, sit in the front seat to know where we were going. My phone started ringing. And I was like, uh, he looked at me and he said, I don't know this number. And I said, don't answer it. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> he answers it. So it, had, it was Bobby Hutchins. Okay. And uh, he said, he said, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm, at, uh, I'm in Myrtle Beach take, taking some time off. And he said, well, I'm in Myrtle Beach too. He said, won't you meet me and we'll go have some ice cream or something. And we were going to try to get hooked up, but it never happened there. But he, so we talked and he said, come and see me when, uh, when you get back. 
So I got back. They were busy. And it was now, a couple. Of, when was this? That was a uh, off season. It was at the beginning of the season, or it might have been in August. Okay. Of of two thousand. Uh, okay. It was late in the year. Okay. And uh, yeah, it was late in the year. And then so when I got back home, they were busy. He called me and said, "Come on up and come see us." And he said, "Let me tell you what we've got going." So they were trying to do something different with Mike Dillon because they just started this the two and the twenty one. Trying to put the shops together, and and I think that was the beginning of the bush side of the bush side of a new concept of two teams working in the same spot, same group of guys intermingling with each other instead of being two separate entities. And he wanted a crew chief for Mike Dillon, and I'm like, heck yeah, man, come to RCR, I'm in. I mean, it was like, you know, I was I thought I had the keys to the castle at that point because when I was at Nashville, you'd look back and you'd see Earnhardt and you'd see these things and Winston Cup scene. You'd see them in <laughs> on whatever of being yeah. at the wind tunnel and knowing yeah. all this stuff. I'm like, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna get to learn it all now. Yeah, I soon learned quickly that the keys to the castle got in and out of the car every week. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, not to take anything away, because very talented, I enjoyed being there. But uh, the team worked so well together. The two, with Todd Barrier was doing Harvick with a two car. And I was uh, doing with Mike. Mike had had several bad crashes that year before I ever got there. And we had a couple of good runs, but he had one more bad crash. We had a flat, I think, at Bristol and hit really hard, knocked the battery out of the car. Wow. And just too many concussions. And so he stepped out of the car, which is devastating for all of us because Mike is a driver going back talking about personalities. I mean, that guy would be there on Monday morning walk through, take everybody to lunch. I mean, was right on top of it, working with everybody in the shop. And it was it was devastating for everybody that he had to get out of the car. Now, but, was that uh, to the end of 2000? That would have been at the, the end of 2000. 2000? Yeah, I think so. Uh, not race. Okay. Yes, I think it was. Okay. You're testing my memory too yeah, much for yeah, me now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you were at RCR the whole entire year in 2001, correct? Yeah. I don't know how else to put it, but whenever anybody thinks of RCR in the year 2001. Right. I mean, there's there's only one thing that really comes to mind. Of course, that's Dale. Is there any way to put into words what the atmosphere was like within the organization? That year? Uh, it, it, was, it was tough, I think, because of the simple reason of – we were going through a huge transition. We had we'd had so much success with that Bush team, and AOL was coming in. Harvick, we had him geared up, cars ready to go. We were going to go cup race, and Harvick was going to go and jump in that car, and everything was going to be ready. And then all of a sudden we go to Daytona, and the accident happens. Then it's just everybody just kind of fell apart yeah. because everybody didn't know what to do. Everybody's kind of graduated back to the shop. And was just standing around, just uh, looking at each other. And Richard had a had a meeting in the old three shop, and got everybody together. When I say everybody, we didn't have that many people back then. Like they've got, we yeah. got up to four hundred something people. But wow. let's just say there was a hundred people in the room, and it was just spitballing what was going to happen. But yeah. basically, everybody there stood behind Richard, told him, "We got this. Go do what you got to do. We'll make certain the cars get to the track." And it was just a complete group effort. Everybody's put their head down and said, we know what we need to do right here, what what would be expected of us to do. But uh, the atmosphere of it was extremely just serious, quiet, no joking around like we normally would be at the shop, everybody cutting up, practical jokes. There was none of that. It was just a very serious situation that – that was hard to get prepared for, especially when the cars had to go back in, back into the paint shop, change the colors to white. Um, it was just a huge transition for everybody, and not just that, an emotional moment for everybody, whether it was Richard, Chocolate, Will Lind, all the guys that had been there forever. I mean, I mean, he was a friend, father, brother, whatever. And uh, so getting everybody through that was tough. You had worked with Mike Dillon, and, of course, he was a member of the family and everything. And if you worked with Mike Dillon and you were working for RCR, I I would assume that you knew Austin Dillon Mm -hmm. way back when. Oh, yeah. From the very beginning. What is your best Austin Dillon story as a youngin', as a kid? Well, I mean, he was always in the shop running around. He 
you had you could always tell if it was Austin or Ty in the shop because Ty was more laid back, more he was just there yeah, and yeah. he was just hanging out yeah austin was like mike bouncing off the walls <laughs> i mean just back and forth yeah, just uh yeah. aggravating people practical jokes might have some kind of little cars going on rc cars you don't know what might be going on from one minute to the next motorcycles the latest the whatever the latest gadget was mike had it and uh had it for him and they would be out there riding them and they'd get to ride them when mike wasn't taking it from them so there was just a lot of stuff like that growing up. And then as they got going into legend racing and uh, late model racing and dirt racing and everything they were doing, uh, we didn't get to see them as much, even though they were on the same complex in a different building a lot of times. And sometimes when the McDowell's would have their cars going, they would come into the shop. But later on, they moved into a shop on complex. So we yeah. got to see them more then. Yeah. But uh, just getting to watch the success that they had and knowing that the – all the effort that was put into that was pretty fun to watch too. With the boss's grandson running around bouncing off the walls, did you have a way of woeing him down? Nah, not really. <laughs> there was no good way to woe him down. That's like saying, was there a good way to woe Mike Dillon down? And there was not. I mean, that was a, that was just a, a personality that you couldn't tame. And you still can't to this day, I'm sure. <laughs> he may be a little bit calmer, yeah. but uh, inside it's still that same rubber ball trying to unwind. <laughs> This segment is brought to our listeners by Las Vegas Motor Speedway, America's racing show place. Gil Martin got out of high school and he had a motorcycle shop that he ran part-time in the evenings when Don Jenkins, a buddy of his, he needed some help out at Nashville Fairgrounds. And Gil goes, man, I don't have time for that stuff. I'm busy enough with the bikes. And so Don says, come on, man, I need to help. Gil goes to the race with Don and that completely changed the course of his life and career. Now, I don't know that Don actually drug him to the track, kicking and screaming, but from the way Gil sounded, he wasn't exactly enthusiastic about that first trip to the racetrack. He's so, probably going to go out there and do what his buddy wanted him to do and go home. That's probably what he thought he was going to do. Well, I'm sure that was probably in the back of his mind yeah. that he was just going to go help Don out and be done with it and go back to the bike shop. And that was going to be that. Well, he got hooked. <laughs> that got me to thinking like so many things do here on the podcast. What is that life changing right place, right time moment for you? I seem to remember you driving by the newspaper office in Martinsville and thinking to yourself, Hey, I need your job. I walked in <laughs> oh, and got the job. <laughs> that's exactly right. I drove by the Martinsville bulletin office on my way to American furniture company to take a job there that my future father-in-law was going to give me. But I said, what the heck? Nothing ventured, nothing gained. I walked into the office of the Martinsville Bulletin. First person I saw was a managing editor. I said, well, sir, do you need a sports writer? He said, yes, we do. Come on back here with me. So I went back there with him and I interviewed him a little bit. I took a current events test. Bingo. I walked out with the job at 25 minutes. And I can tell you, I did not know where I was going to go after I took that job. But six months later, I got a call from the much bigger and prestigious Roanoke Times to ask to come there and interview for a job. And I got that job. And I was there 10 years before I went to a publication in Concord, North Carolina, known as Grand National Scene. And the rest, as they say, Rick, is history. I've only had three full-time jobs my entire adult life. Now, Steve, be honest. Did you stop by the Martinsville newspaper because you were interested in journalism or because maybe possibly you didn't want to work for your future father-in-law? Uh, both. <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't now, see myself in a furniture factory, man. Ooh. Did you have any kind of background whatsoever? Yeah. I was a sports it, editor at the Old Dominion University paper called the Mason Crown. Okay. So you did have yeah. a little bit of a journalism background. Sure. Yeah. Okay. All right. For me, it is the Bristol press box, the 1992 night race. 
I wanted to be there because I wanted to go to work for Winston Cup scene one day. And at the time I was doing stringer work for the paper in Columbia, Tennessee, Jerry Langford, who was the sports editor at the time for the Wilkes journal Patriot in North Wilkesboro. And he did not want to be there. It was just another assignment for him. He was not a NASCAR guy, but we wound up talking all the way through the race. And Jerry is actually the one who loaned me a couple of dollars at North Wilkesboro a few weeks later to buy some food. And then the very next day, he told me about the job at the Allegheny news and Steve, what would have happened if I'd never met Jerry? If I don't meet Jerry, if he sits anywhere else in the press box other than right next to me, or if he doesn't go the race at all, I don't get the job in Sparta. If I don't get the job in Sparta, highly doubt that I ever go to work for Winston Cup Sane. If I don't get the job in Sparta, I doubt that I ever meet Janie. And if I don't meet Janie, there's no Adam and Jesse. I mean, we can't have that now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jerry. <laughs> So yes, I owe everything to Jerry Lang. So that's my right place, right time meeting. Now, as for Gil, Gil and another buddy, Andy Dunlap, they start a late model team there at Nashville and Bobby Hamilton starts driving for them and they proceed to win the track championship a couple of times. Gil gets a mentor in Mike Alexander. It was our interview guest a few weeks back and Gil says he will never be able to repay Mike for everything that Mike did. Phil Martasi was also running a team there at the fairgrounds. And according to Gil, Phil gets tired of getting beat all the time. And he winds up buying Gil's team. <laughs> well, that's one way to do it. <laughs> <laughs> if you can't beat them, buy them. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> and then they moved to the wondrous world of the Bush series. And here's what I truly loved about what Gil had to say about those seasons in the Bush series. When Philmar racing left to go to a race, everybody piled into the van and took off. There were no boys back at the shop to thank from victory lane because that team was so small, but that wasn't anything out of the ordinary back in those days. No, you're right. That back in those days, there were a lot of teams like that. When somebody had an issue at the track, people from other teams would pitch in and help with parts and pieces and labor. And Steve Gill said that the Houston's Andy and Marty and Scott and Tommy, they were particularly helpful. Well, of course they were, they were Houston. That's right. (laughs) (laughs) Most of that family name is pretty good. (laughs) He's now down boy down. (laughs) Bob Labonte, who of course is Terry and Bobby's dad. He could be rough. And he could be tough and he could be ornery. But if you were in trouble and needed a helping hand, he would help out. Oh, That's Bob true. Bonnie. That's true. That's exactly the way he was. Saw him perform that way many, many times. The old softy. Yep. <laughs> I say that knowing that he's nowhere near. <laughs> <laughs> New River Valley up in Virginia, 1992. The rules stated at the time that cars had to run a Detroit locker pipe rear end and Philmar racing and Gil Martin, they read the rule book and they interpreted it and they put in the rear end that they wanted to put in. Jeff Burton takes the checkered flag and goes to victory lane. He gets the trophy, takes it home, but he winds up disqualified due to an illegal or unapproved rear end. Bobby Dodder is awarded the victory and it's the only one of his Bush series career and Steve he doesn't even get to go to victory lane in his one and only win. I always wondered how Bobby felt about that. That had to be a huge disappointment, even though he's credited with a victory and got all the rewards the victory gives you. He still didn't get over victory lane and have people cheer for him and celebrate. You know, here's a question I did not ask Gil that I should have. I wonder if they gave the trophy back. Oh. Uh, I don't know. Oh, oh, you got to have that trophy. I'm sure Bobby got the paycheck, but that trophy, we're hunting trophies in this business, baby. <laughs> <laughs> the money gets spent, but the trophy stays behind. Gil said that the only other thing to come out of it was that Robert Black, who was the Bush Series director at the time, 
he wound up rewriting the rule book to say that Detroit locker rear ends only were allowed. Which is what it should have said in the first place. Don't you think, Chris? <laughs> so evidently there's a big difference between Detroit locker rear end type and Our Detroit only. locker rear ends only <laughs> <laughs> were allowed. Gil mentioned the fact that Jake Elder's last job in the sport was with Philmar Race. I did not know that. Yeah. Jake was pretty much the definition of what it meant to be old school. He was a very successful crew chief, but Steve, we've kind of mentioned it before here on the show, but reading and writing, that wasn't exactly in his wheelhouse. That's, that's a fair way to put it. Yeah. yeah. Well, that being said, Jake won a total of 44 races during his career with drivers like Darrell Waltrip, Davey Allison, Morgan Shepard, Dell Earnhardt, David Pearson. Benny Parsons, Bobby Allison, Mario Andretti, Dick Hutcherson, and Steve, he started his career at Petty Enterprises. So if you go back and look at it, six of the nine drivers that he won races with are in the NASCAR Hall of Fame, and one of the three who isn't in the NASCAR Hall of Fame is Mario Andretti. So he worked with some really high-profile people, but with Jake, it wasn't so much by the book, so to speak. It was simply watching the way that he went about his business of actually hands-on working on the race cars. And we've mentioned it many times here on the show. There was also the do as I do and do as I say (laughs) factor with him. And he did not stay in one place very long ever. Well, with Jake, if things weren't done his way, he didn't go and complain about it. He just left and went somewhere else. Suitcase Jake. He won 44 races and he won a championship or two with David Pearson. So he is certainly worthy of the NASCAR hall of fame, but I honestly believe that the fact that he did not stay in one place very long hurts his chances at one day getting into the NASCAR hall of fame, because certainly the numbers are there, but the crew chiefs who are in the hall are very closely associated with one driver or one team. You got Ray Everham, who of course made his mark with Jeff Gordon. You got Dell Emmon with Richard Petty and then Leonard Wood and Wood Brothers Racing. Waddell Wilson is in the Hall of Fame and he worked with a number of different teams, but I think he's in the Hall of Fame as much for his engine building as he is for being a crew chief. Rick, you make a very good point about one team, one driver, one crew chief. However, Lake won so many races with so many different drivers on so many different teams. I think that's a really great accomplishment on its own. I mean, I just think that deserves merit when considering him for the Hall of Fame, that he could win anywhere and with anyone. All that leads me to this, unless I'm very seriously mistaken, and we know that that can't be. (laughs) Do we? (laughs) There are only three crew chiefs currently in the NASCAR Hall of Fame, or four if you count Waddell Wilson. Only three crew chiefs in the NASCAR Hall of Fame. Well, Rick, there's one thing I do have to point out. Drivers get the headlines. Uh Drivers get the media attention. Drivers get the fans' attention. It's the drivers we see in the newspapers and in other publications and on video standing up in victory lane while the confetti flies all around. It's not the crew chiefs. Now, that might not seem to be very fair, but it is the way it is. Milt Heflin was a space shuttle era flight director, and he was my co-author on Go Flight. I wrote the book, but he poured through it with a fine tooth comb to make sure that all the technical crap. (laughs) I mean, the technical aspects (laughs) of the manuscript were accurate. And I don't know what I had written but it did not pass the serious flight test. And I got an email with two words in great big bold type with about 10 exclamation points. And it read, fix it. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Now my point in telling you this story is you've got to vote on who gets into the NASCAR hall of fame. And there are only three crew chiefs in the NASCAR hall of fame. So it's up to you. Fix it. (laughs) Rick, I'll do my best, but I am only one guy. (laughs) Going to have to have some help here. 
I have spoken. <laughs> <laughs> For what that's worth. <laughs> Philmar Racing moved to Winston Cup in 1995, and they just weren't as successful as they had hoped it would be. Elmo Langley, who was by that time NASCAR's pace car driver, and a lot of times Gil would go to Elmo and ask, should we requalify? Should we stand on our first round time? What's the weather going to be like? Hot, cold, sunny, cloudy, rain, snow, sleet, whatever. <laughs> and Elmo was the go-to guy on that because... He had been an independent driver and team owner for so long. He had been concerned about those kinds of things and making the field and scratching his way into the field. He'd been concerned about those kinds of things forever. And that's a good thing to consult someone like Elmo because he had such experience at trying to make the race and do what he could in the race. He had to take all kinds of, you know, cut corners as most independents did. So with that experience, he became very valuable. Gil did wind up leaving Philmar Racing in 1997 and eventually got hooked up with Bill Davis Racing, where he worked with Dave Blaney. And today, a lot of drivers have backgrounds racing on dirt. But back then, it wasn't nearly as common. And Steve, here's something that I think speaks volumes about a driver crew chief relationship. Gil said that he might have done some good for Dave, but he also said that he might have done him a disservice. Because he gave Dave what Dave wanted. And because Dave was a dirt car driver, he wanted his car loose. And sometimes that works while driving a big, heavy stock car. But a lot of times it doesn't, and the car needs to be tightened up. But because Gil gave Dave the setup that he was most comfortable with, that meant a lot of times that he was fast in practice and qualifying, but during a longer race, it was hard to hang on to and keep the car out of the fence. Now, here's where you see a difference between Gil and let's say old Jake. Jake <laughs> would have changed that car and told Dave, drive it or else. That's as simple as that. Gil got a job offer from Richard Childress Racing to serve as Mike Dillon's crew chief and to help merge their Bush Series teams into one functional unit. Still two cars, but basically operating as one. And I thought this was pretty funny. Gil said that it was pretty easy to tell when Austin Dillon was in the shop as opposed to Ty. Austin was bouncing off the walls, and Ty was way more laid back. And, of course, Austin and Ty are Mike's sons. Well, they have a game plan at RCR going into the 2001 season. Kevin Harvick is going to run a limited Winston Cup schedule, and he's going to go for the Bush Series Championship. They're going to get him ready for his rookie year in 2002. Everything's going to be great. But then the 2001 Daytona 500 happened. And we know what happened there. Steve, this segment is brought to our listeners by Las Vegas Motor Speedway, America's racing show place. And in the April 16th, 1992 issue of Winston Cup scene, we have talked about Davy Allison and the 1992 Winston Cup season plenty of times here on the show. But this week specifically, Davy clawed his way back to the mountaintop for the first time that season after hitting a bump in the road the race before at Bristol. Davy had been in an accident in the spring race at Bristol, and he wound up with severely bruised ribs on his right side, torn cartilage, his shoulder blade was beaten up. And the pain was so bad that he couldn't even sleep for two or three nights. Well, Friday before the North Wilkesboro race, folks from the Moretz sports medicine facility in Hickory met with Davey in his hotel room. It didn't ultrasound. They rubbed him down with cortisone cream and got him hooked up with a TENS unit. What in the world is that? A TENS unit, the electronic stimulant that's got the electronic pads. Yeah, sends the electronic waves into your back or shoulder or whatever's injured or whatever to kind of okay. stimulate the muscles. Okay. Davey ran the race wrapped in ace bandages, wearing the TENS unit. He had a, on an orthoplast, which I assume is a piece of hard plastic to kind of keep everything in place, and a flak jacket. He was in there like a suit of armor in that well, race. I, I have seen drivers race with flak jackets. But I never heard of the tins or the other devices at all. 
Well, if you've never heard of a TENG unit, I'm going to have to assume that you've never used a TENG unit because mm-hmm. I can guarantee you <laughs> if you've ever used one, you'll remember it. You are correct with your assumption. <laughs> <laughs> I have one for my back because I, my back is just, I, I don't even know what to say about it. It's just crushed. I don't know what the deal is. It hurts like the devil. But anyway, I have one for my back. And here a few months ago, I went to take one of the pads off my back, but I forgot to turn it off. Uh oh. And I shocked the shoe shoe out of myself. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'm trying to get the stupid thing turned off with my hand still zapping. But instead of turning it off, I turned it up to about 11. <laughs> now you're going to get parboiled. <laughs> oh, you may think that's funny. I do. <laughs> but it ain't nowhere near Randy LaJoy's Tins unit store. And I'm just going to leave that one up to your imagination. I won't take much imagination to figure out what happened to Randy on this one. (laughs) Okay, moving right along. The team had Jimmy Hensley on standby in the pits. And when we talked to Larry McReynolds on the show, he said that he walked over to Jimmy at one point and said, I appreciate you being here. I appreciate the help. Davey ain't getting out of that car. (laughs) (laughs) Alan Kowicki started from the pole that day. And he led the first 135 laps and 182 of the first 187, while Davey found himself in a tangle in turn two with Kyle Petty on lap 128. Davey said, Kyle hooked me pretty good. It wasn't deliberate, but the way we were hooked together, I could tell I was in for a long slide in the grass. And the caution almost didn't come out. And Davey was just about to go a lap down. But then Dick Trickle also spun to finally bring out the yellow flag. Very fortunate for Davey, I would say. Davey worked his way back up through the field and was running second behind Rusty Wallace when Bobby Hillen and Kyle Petty got together on lap 311. And we'll talk more about the Petty Hillen run in in just a second. But the field pitted during the caution. The Robert Yates racing crew got Davey off the pit road first. And that was all she wrote. How many times? And we said on this show, this team got their driver out first. And that was all she wrote. Pitch stops. I'm telling you, they make a difference. Davies said, I wasn't sure I was going to make it. My left leg started cramping up during the next to last caution period. My calf cramped and I pulled my leg closer to me and under my right leg. When I did that, my thigh cramped. I kept tapping the brake and clutch to stretch the leg. And I drank a lot of fluids. Fortunately, when the green flag came out, those cramps went away. But then my right leg cramped. I didn't know if I was going to be able to operate the throttle like I wanted. But after a lap, that cramp went away. After that, I was just glad to get to the end of the race. Look at me. I'm give out. I don't have much left over. I've had a few leg cramps in my day. And I want to tell you, Rich, that boy was in agony. And driving a race car to boot. Ah. Now, I think that that last sentence is pretty telling because he said, I'm just glad to get to the end of the race. Look at me. I'm give out. I don't have much left over. And again, when we talked to Larry Mack about this race, he said that after inspection and they were ready to pile into the van to go back to the shop or go back home. He had to wait on Davey because Davey was signing autographs. Oh, man. (laughs) As for Bobby Hillen and Kyle Petty, this was the only race that Bobby ran for Kel Yarbrough Motorsports. It turns out that Bobby had himself a day at North Wilkesboro. Bobby and Kyle got together. NASCAR promptly put Bobby in the penalty box for five laps. Let's explain the penalty box. That was the NASCAR idea to immediately punish drivers for rough driving or any other infraction that they saw. There was a complaint at one time that NASCAR would take its time about issuing penalties, sometimes not till the race was over. You remember that, Rick? Oh, this yeah. idea was to correct that. NASCAR was saying, we're going to punish you right away if you do something we don't like. Now, it was somewhat successful and cooling drivers down, no doubt about that. But it also went away in time because I think it was just too arbitrary and something had to be done about that. 
Well, something like that is very, very hard to police because you simply just don't know what happened. Brakes absolutely positively could fail at the wrong time. Right. right. And you bobble or you lose control and you get in somebody. So yeah, that it was, that's too, it was too subjective. Yeah, it was absolutely. Too subjective. Our buddy, Jamie Bishop was working for Kel at that time. And he is right there gassing the car and he's working on Kel's crew. Well, here comes Felix Sabatis storming into the pits and Felix goes over the wall up to Bobby's window and he's yelling and hollering at Bobby. Yeah. It wasn't the only time Felix did that either. I've seen it more than once. Well, according to Jamie, the guy who was cleaning the grill on the car saw Felix. And when he was bringing that big, long handled pole back over the wall, he made sure to whack Felix in the back <laughs> of the legs with it. <laughs> Now there's a tiny little detail for you. <laughs> Felix said, I think NASCAR should park him or put him behind the wall. I think there should be more of a penalty other than the five lap penalty. We were racing on the lead lap. Hillen is a lap, two laps down. And he's racing us. We gave him the line twice to pass us. And he takes the stupid left-hand lane instead of picking the outside lane. When we take the inside lane, he can't go anywhere. So he puts Kyle in the wall. Not exactly surprisingly, Bobby had a different view. Bobby said, I was all the way up beside him. We got penalized before they had a chance to look at the tapes. And that's not right. We've got to look at this more closely when these things happen. I shouldn't have been penalized. I'm not happy about it. Now, with situations just like Bobby explained, that eventually led NASCAR to drop the penalty box. Just that very reason right there. Well, evidently Kyle had gotten into Davy and spun Davy. Should Kyle have been put in the penalty box too? That's, that's <laughs> the flaw. <laughs> well, here's the thing. Davy and Kyle had their run in and then they get together coming to the finish line in that year's the Winston all-star race. Bobby and Kyle got together and then they're back at it in the following year's Daytona 500. So I guess what goes around comes around. Now here's the connection between this incident and our new studio at the NASCAR Technical Institute. I went down to Jamie Bishop's shop last week, and he got us hooked up with a bunch of posters for the studio and one of his old gas cans and a couple of uniforms that had been worn by Bobby. And one is a Stavola Brothers Miller uniform, and the other is the suit that he wore in this race. How cool is that? That's great. <laughs> Thank and you, Jamie. And you can actually see on the inside of the suit where Bobby's nameplate has been sewn over where Chad Little's name had been embroidered into the suit. Chad had been let go, and this was Bobby's first and only race with Kel Yarbrough Motorsports. Now, what did Chad think about all that? <laughs> oh, I'm so glad you asked. <laughs> Chad said, I wasn't comfortable with them, and they weren't comfortable with me. Crew chief Bob Johnson had no confidence in me and he didn't want to try and find it. Ooh, there you go. Huh. Well, first of all, I don't want to be the one to get on Bob Johnson's bad side. I'm just going to say, uh, <laughs> Bob Johnson was, Ooh, you talk about can be cranky. Bob was up there. Yes, sir. Well, later Chad added, I don't think the team will improve until the crew chief and driver have a great relationship or Kel puts his heart into it. So he can see firsthand what is going on instead of taking somebody else's word for it. I don't feel I was given a fair opportunity to get the job done. They're still working on two cars they had when Dick trickle was there and Dick didn't feel comfortable in the cars either. I lost the battle, not the war. The war is making a career in Winston cup racing. And I'm still convinced I can do it. Now he threw some pretty hefty bombs in there. Didn't he? Absolutely. <laughs> Until Kel puts his heart into it. Yeah. Uh-huh. Ooh. <laughs> that. Oh, that, yeah. I don't, that's yeah. cutting it mighty close. <laughs> One of the two photo bios in this issue featured Joe Lewis, who will go down in history as one of the friendliest people ever to step foot in a NASCAR garage. Do you remember Joe? Oh, yes. I remember Joe. Joe was the truck driver for Richard Jackson. And Rick Mast at the time. And the year before I rode with Joe from the team shop in Denver, North Carolina to the season finale in Atlanta, 
he was such a good guy. He was. We did a story with Joe years ago where Deb Williams and Cindy Kim, now Cindy Elliott, rode with Joe to write the story and photograph it all the way. And afterward, I remember Joe come up to me and we were talking one time and he said, you know, I think Deb and Cindy are just like my daughters. How about that? <laughs> When NASCAR conducted its first tire test at Indianapolis Motor Speedway that year, it was big news. I mean, it was huge news. But I did not remember this. The precursor to that test was an IROC test that was covered in this issue, and Dave Marcus took part in that test. Dave said, the track is nice and smooth. I don't think there is a bump on it. We were averaging over 155 miles an hour in our tests, and I think a Winston Cup car could go as much as 10 miles an hour faster because an IROC car is heavier. Winston Cup cars could run three abreast down the straights and two abreast in the corners very easily. There is virtually nothing the track needs to do to accommodate us. The pits are large enough, pit road is long enough, and there is plenty of seating and garage space. Just put up the Winston Cup Series sign and tell us to come on. That is a truly historic moment that Dave Marcus truly impacted. And it's remarkable how right Dave was. The Winston Cup cars could indeed race three abreast in Indianapolis and did nearly all the way through the Brickyard 400. The pit pass section in this issue was a true goldmine. Del Jarrett remembered an incident that took place at North Wilkesboro back in 1964. Dale said, they used to let people cross the track during cautions, and we were in line to leave. Evidently, Ned had had trouble, and he fell out early. They'd have a couple of cautions, and we'd move up a couple of positions to get out. It finally got our turn to leave. I had just been out of the car, and for some reason, I forgot to close the doors when I got back in. Just as we cleared the racetrack, I fell out of the car. My brother, Glenn, jumped out of the car after me. It hurt him worse. Then it hurt me. Steve, that, that, that could have been, been serious. Yeah, that yeah. could have been serious. They're very serious. Dale was lucky there. Bud Green was a crew member for Junior Johnson and Associates, and he had to go potty during practice for the North Wilkesboro event the day before the race. He goes into the porta potty. Somebody proceeds to lock him in. <laughs> <laughs> Not an unusual occurrence at North Wilkesboro. <laughs> Well, it is at that point when both Tim Brewer and Bill Elliott started calling him on the radio. So evidently Bud had a scanner, but he didn't have one that could transmit. So Bud is locked in the porta potty. He can hear them calling for him rather urgently, needing his help right then, but he can't respond. So Tim Brewer said, we started telling Bud to come here and we needed him really bad. He has a radio but he can't transmit on it. We let him stew in there for a while, and then I let him out. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I once locked Ricky Rudd in the porta potty at North Wolfboro, and I was standing right outside the door waiting to see how hard he would rattle that door trying to get out. Well, I heard one or two rattles going on, and I thought to myself, you know, you've seen Ricky Rudd when he was not happy. I mean, this guy is an absolute <laughs> fighting, banning rooster. You might want to open that door, which I did very promptly and <laughs> smiled at him. <laughs> okay. So what was Ricky's reaction? Well, he looked at me kind of harsh first, and then he said, ah, what the heck? And he smiled back. <laughs> I was lucky. All right. So Steve, finally, last but not least, I'm going through this section. And there is a note that reads, congratulations to John and Kelly Dodson on the birth of their first child. Hunter Nicole was born April 9th at 1219 AM in Davies Hospital in Statesville, North Carolina, weighed six pounds, 13 ounces, and was 19 inches long. So I saw that and I said, well, that's John Dodson's daughter. That's cool. So I took a photo of it and I texted it to John. Well, here's the thing about that. Scene ran for 32 years and the grand total of all the issues is I, Steve, I don't know for sure. It's somewhere between 1500 and 2000 issues. 
Well, I picked this one out because of the connection to the Bobby Hill in uniform, completely at random. And here's the announcement of John Dotson's daughter's birth on April 9th, 1992. You want to take a wild guess what the date was when I found this little item? I believe I know. Go ahead, Rick. <laughs> it was Saturday, April 9th, 2022. <laughs> Before we head up to Martinsville, I thumbed through this issue right quick. I saw that, texted it to John on April 9th. So not only was it on Hunter Nicole's birthday, Steve, it was her 30th birthday. That's right. 30 years that? to the day. How out of that? all these issues, it's the one that gets picked out. That it's, is absolutely crazy. It's fate, Rick. It was just fate. <laughs> At the time, John was the shop foreman and front tire changer for Bob Whitcomb Racing and driver Derek Cope at the time. And on the morning of the race, John brought his wife, Kelly, and newborn daughter, Hunter Nicole, home from the hospital. And the race was starting as John left the house to head to the track. He got to the track during the second caution and was able to cross the track to start his day's work. Now, I don't know about you, Rick, but if I bought my wife and first child home from the hospital and then left to go to work, I'm not so sure I'd be able to come back if you get my drift. <laughs> Hi, everybody. This is Jimmy Mange. Hey, race fans. I'm Mike Alexander. Hello, I'm Terry Labonte. I'm Steve Mill. I'm Rusty Wallace, and you're listening to the Scene Vault Podcast. Hello, Scene Vault fans. This is Brian from Speedway Screens. And if you're enough of a NASCAR historian to be listening to this podcast, there's a good chance a piece of the past you've been on the hunt for is in my shop. I'm constantly on the hunt for apparel and collectibles from all genres and eras of motorsports. So whether it be cup cars, dirt modifieds, dragsters, or monster trucks, I've probably got something for you. Check out my inventory at speedwaytsj.etsy.com and be sure to follow me on Instagram and Twitter at Speedway Screens for the newest items as soon as they drop and for a peek at what I keep for my own collection. As a special thank you to listeners of this show, just enter scene at checkout for 10% off. Speedwaytsj.etsy.com. That's speedwaytsj.etsy.com. This podcast has been brought to our listeners by Las Vegas Motor Speedway, America's racing show place. And Steve, I wanted to save this for last, but I got outed last week on Twitter. Okay. I'll take you at your word about that. Okay. All right. I got outed at Seabird 739-36300 tweeted. Are you still doing your morning walks? I know you reached your goal, but you never say anything about doing your walks. And Steve, when he tweeted that, it was like old Chris had taken a two by four and whacked me between the eyes with it. And I know a few weeks ago, I think it was our first episode of the season. I know that I mentioned that it was my goal. It was my New Year's resolution to get to 6,000 miles by the end of this year. I ain't going to make it. And I responded to Chris and I said, ask me no questions and I'll tell you no lies. I have done exactly 2.2 miles this year. Not up to your past, Rick, but I believe there's a reason for it. Well, I don't know if there's a reason so much as I've got a bunch of excuses. And Steve, I'm going to be honest with you. Very seriously, the whole ACBJ scene, Marcus Lamonis walking challenge summer before last is right up there at the top of the list. That is by far the most difficult thing that I've ever done. Walking 350 miles in three and a half months in the hottest and most human three and a half months of the year in the middle of a pandemic. But by gosh, it was going to be worth it all if it meant that you and I were going to be able to gain control of a product that we had literally dedicated our lives to for so many years. Then to have the rug yanked out from under us the way that it was, come away from that with nothing to show for it. I don't know that I will ever get over that and steve I, again my cards are out on the table we had some things go down a few weeks ago we found out some things from certain people 
and I was so spun out that I very seriously considered not doing the show the following week. But you and I talked about it. This podcast not the way is, to go. It's not yeah, the way to go. Yeah. This podcast has been what kept me going. The uh, everybody's support. And Steve, I don't want to over dramatize this and say that it's like PTSD or anything like that, but it is very hard for me to put those memories behind me when I walk now of, of how hard it was to walk all that way in such a short amount of time and then literally to have nothing to come from it. Now, I know that the reaction is going to be from a lot of people. You got healthier during that walk. It did you a lot of good. I got to say, I'm not so sure about that. I actually gained 10 pounds that summer. And my back, Steve, my, I, I can't even, my back hurts. Uh, that's, that's all I can say. My back really, really, really hurts. And I've been to our family doctor and I'm going to an orthopedist to see if I can get some help. But listen, before I stop whining this week, it turns out that I've actually got some pretty severe arthritis in my back. But that being said, when I tweeted that I hadn't been walking this year, I got some amazing messages of support. And Chris replied to my tweet and he said, I care about you, brother. And I just want to see you healthy. God bless. So that was pretty awesome. And then Kathleen McDonald at KHI fan, who was such an encouragement. She tweeted, it's completely understandable. Your walking was so woven into the deal. I can't imagine that stain will ever go away. I have faith that some way, somehow your dream will become a reality. And when things start to turn that corner, you'll be rejuvenated. And then (laughs) she just had to include that hashtag, hashtag keep digging. Ow. (laughs) (laughs) Keep digging. Okay. All right, Kathleen. Yeah. Okay. Keep digging. But then I got a direct message on Twitter from Eric Jones at E9 Dodge. Eric said, Rick, you seem like a really decent person and a gentleman. I keep writing a long message and delete it when I just need to write a short one. So here it goes. Get back on that horse. In media, social media, and life, we are swamped with bad news, horrific events, people being ugly and nasty. You seem to be a genuinely good guy. That deal with the scene stinks, and many people watching it see that way too. But you are also sharing memories of a sport and times so many of us love. We also witnessed your efforts in kicking the Diet Pepsi habit and walking, and those reminders help light the way for others you do not even know. Don't let them get to you. People are out here praying for each other, and more of us are rooting for each other than against. Unfortunately, we only hear from the latter sometimes. Hang in there. You never know how many people in your neighborhood and social media were encouraged by your walking and efforts. I think we are called to be light in the world. I fail every day, but at least we keep trying. The struggle is real. So, Steve, how can I not go walk after that? Rick, I say go walk if you want to, but Arthritis is a mean beast. And if you're in real pain and you're back with arthritis, please be cautious. Rick, we will prevail. Test, test. Yeah. We got a signal here. Yeah, we're good. We are good. All right. Gilbert. Ray, you jump in there and check your audio. I think that says diesel. That's just a sticker on the sticker. It is. It is. Go ahead and say ABC. ABC, one, two, three. All right. All right. Scoot in just a little bit. There you go. Your cell phone on? Yeah. 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 Yeah.